welcome to Next Level Church, and welcome to Costume Sunday. You guys look fabulous, by the way. Incredible. Uh, some of you went all out, and if you didn't dress up, that's totally cool. You're just as welcome here. But uh, our worship leader, Jaden, I don't know if you noticed, not only did he shave his beard to try to look more like me, he also cut his hair so that it was really, he didn't go completely bald, but he cut it so under the hat, all you could see is, is his skin. And somehow, he snuck into my house and stole one of my shirts. He's wearing my Ninja Turtle shirt. Pretty incredible. Well, uh, we are uh, concluding our series uh, today, Fighting Fear. And before we get into things, I do want to give a couple shout outs. First of all, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, our first time guests, and especially to those who serve in the military. Would you help me welcome them? And I want to give uh, one more uh, shout out. Uh, Next Level Church is almost 12 years old, and uh, we were started by, uh, there was 50 uh, people, who uh, families and, and individuals, who helped us start the church. And our area is a very transient area, and so there's been a bunch of people who have moved on. There's been a bunch of people who uh, haven't been here all 12 years. But there's a couple families who have been here for every year, and they've been a part of it, and they've been owners. And one of those families, the, the husband, the, the, the father of the family, uh, he is a great behind-the-scenes type guy. And most people don't know, he, he's not like bragging or, or like around. Most people may not know all that he does for us. But one of the key things that he does as an owner is in an old building, we are constantly having some issues. And he is an electrician. And oftentimes we call him and say, hey, can you fix this? Can you do, can you do something to fix it? And uh, on Wednesday nights for our students, I noticed that in our game room, we had all the lights on, but only one was working. And so it was really dark in there. And so we called him, and he came on after work and came on his own time. And apparently it wasn't the light bulbs. It was the ballast, which I don't even know what that is. But he fixed all of that. And I didn't realize how bad it was until this past Wednesday when the first student that saw me was like, Pastor Rob, what's going on in the game room? It's so bright. We can actually see each other. And I was like, yeah, it got fixed. We fixed it this week. And so uh, I'm so appreciative of him and of his family. Would you help me uh, give them some love? <laughs> so today we're concluding our series, Fighting Fear. And I want to do something a little bit different today. It's my goal today to not tell you what to think, but to help teach you how to think. And I want to specifically help you to learn how to decipher the voice of fear and how to think in a way that when the voice of fear speaks to you, you know, okay, that's coming from fear, it's not coming from God, and you can instead choose to listen to the voice of God. If you've been around Next Level for a amount of time, you've probably heard me say what I'm about to say, but I think it is so important, and I think once you learn it, you will start to see how this works in almost every organization, on almost every commercial, on almost every politician, they use the same formula to try to motivate us to do what they want us to do. There are two main ways to motivate people, and these are used over and over again. The first is what's called carrots and sticks. Carrots and sticks is a reward. It's a bonus. It's if you buy this, then we'll throw in this other thing for free. Uh, this, this past week, I was at the gym, and I got sucked into an infomercial. And I don't normally watch infomercials, but this thing was amazing. It was called uh, Ninja Tape. And the guy kept taking tape, and he would put it on something, and it would hold, like, the heaviest things. He took it, and he put it on a pull-up bar, and he hung it on his ceiling, and he started doing pull-ups on the bar. But then the amazing thing about ninja tape is it just comes off. Like, after he did the pull-ups, he pulled the bar off, and it left no sticky residue, and you could re-stick it. And then he takes a shelf, and he puts a shelf on in his house, and he, like, hangs weights from the shelf. And he's like, ninja tape. It's, and I'm like, I'm there. Take my money. Like, this is amazing. Ninja tape. <laughs> It's great. But then the infomercial ended by saying for the low price of $19.99, you can get ninja tape. But wait, there's more. If you act now, we'll throw in two free rolls of ninja tape. Now let me just give you a little, little wisdom here. If any time a product is, is, is too good to be true, it probably is. And if they throw in extra free stuff, it's their way of saying don't trust our product. It's not good enough. But we know if we give you something free, you will buy it. Like, for example, I've never been into the Apple store to buy a Mac computer, and I walk up, and they're like, hey, for the low price of $1,199, we'll give you this Mac, and if you act now, we'll throw in a free iPad. Like, I've never done that. Why? Because most companies that know what they have will charge a little bit more, but it's because it's a good product. 
and you don't need extra motivation to buy it. We will just buy it, we will support it, it's more money, but it's worth the cost. So carrots and sticks. The second way that, that people try to motivate others is with fear and manipulation. Fear and manipulation. And in products, it's often like act now, don't lay, limited time offer, this won't last forever. Why are they doing that? Because they're trying to get the fear of missing out. They're trying to cause us to say, well, if I don't buy this right now, I'm going to have regret. I'm going to miss out on something. So constantly, products and companies are trying to evoke fear. One of the main reasons I cannot stand politics in our country today is because the main way that politicians try to motivate us is with fear. Instead of just standing up and saying, this is what I believe is best for our country, they all the time are saying, that's what's wrong with our country. And if you vote for them, our country's going to be destroyed and it's going to be horrible. And they're constantly using fear. They're using fear to get us out into the polls. And why do they use fear? Because the best and easiest way to raise billions of dollars is to scare people to death. If you scare people, they will give. And they'll give a lot of money. And so politicians are constantly causing us to be afraid. And this type of leadership, and this type of marketing, it is so prevalent, it has become very home in churches. Like churches have just adapted it. And I think that it's come from people and pastors who are very well-meaning. I, I don't think that they're, they're evil. I don't think they have any uh, like evil intent. But I think they are fearful people. And when you are a fearful person, you use fearful language to try to motivate other people. And often in the church world, we have used carrots and sticks and fear and manipulation to try to get people to do what we want them to do. Carrots and, and, and sticks, uh, it, it often looks like this. If you give financially back to the church, God will bless you. If you want good health and good wealth, give financially to God. What is that, carrots and sticks? Christians, we should not give because we're being manipulated or because we want something extra from God. We give because God's already given to us. And you got to be really careful because, again, I don't think these people are evil. I don't think that they're trying to do something wrong, but it is a way to manipulate us. If you do this, then we'll give you this extra thing. And I would say our product... Our Jesus is good enough that you don't need something extra. You don't need to add a carrot and stick to it. God's love is so good, that's all we need. But there's a second way that churches often try to motivate people, and it's with fear and manipulation. And it's this fear of, if you don't do this, there's going to be a massive consequence. Last year, I saw a, a pastor, he posted on, on Instagram, and the clip that he posted was he was trying to lead his church to raise millions of dollars for a, a big new building. They already were in a big building, but they needed a bigger building. And he says in the clip, he says, people keep asking me, why do we need a bigger building? I'll tell you why we need a bigger building. Because if you don't give towards this building, you are telling lost people to go to hell. Okay? What is he doing? Fear and manipulation. We might need a bigger building. And the way that we get a build, bigger building is that people give generously to it. But you don't have to attach fear to that. In fact, I, I, I am so against any time I hear, especially in church circles where they try to start leading people with fear and manipulation, like my skin just crawls. I'm, I'm like, ah, because the truth is, is a lot of us who grew up in church, we grew up in fear-based environments and we didn't even know it because it was well-meaning people who loved Jesus and they loved God. They did the best that they could, but they used fear to try to motivate us to do something. I don't know about you, but I grew up uh, in a church where I, I constantly heard about hell. And so like, I asked Jesus into my heart like a hundred times before I was like 13 years old. And I remember one time we were living in Fort Riley, Kansas, and uh, we were on the military base housing, and our house was a three-story house, and my bedroom was the top bedroom in a three-story house, and I had bunk beds with my brother, and I was on the top bunk. So I was as high in this house as you possibly could get. <laughs> and that day, people were talking about storms and tornadoes, and in Kansas, storms are a real thing. And so I remember as a third grader going to bed and praying to God, Dear God, just in case I'm not one of your sheep, and I die tonight because of a tornado, I don't want to wake up in hell, so will you save my soul? Now, what a horrible fear for a third grader to have. 
Like, our motivation is not to come to God because we're afraid of something. Our motivation is to come to God because He loves us. And He loves us just not to save us from hell. He wants to save us right now, here. We don't just accept God for some eternity thing. Yeah, that's a bonus. That's what we get. But we accept God's love because it's what's best for us. And he sent his son to die for us. And so this idea of carrots and sticks and fear manipulation, it is everywhere. And now that you hear this, now that you see it, you're going to see it in advertising. You're going to see it in articles you read. You're going to be like, okay, that's, that's carrots and sticks. That's fear and manipulation. It is used all the time. And the question is, Why? Why do so many people use this? And I'll tell you the reason, at least in my opinion, that so many people use it. It's because it's really hard to motivate people to do anything, especially when you're dealing with volunteers. And if you've ever coached like a little league team or if you're a public school teacher and like they don't provide the supplies that you need and so you rely on parents to supply the needs and you send out a very nice letter and you're like, hey, we just need tissues. All your kids are sick. We need tissues. Please send tissues. And all the parents are like, nah, I'm good. And if you've been in any position where you've needed help and you didn't have money to pay someone and you wanted volunteers to help you, the vast majority of people are like, nah, I'm good. In fact, I saw a, a clip and it reminded me of this. Uh, it's from uh, a classic television show. I don't know if you grew up watching the Ninja Turtles from the 90s, but there's a clip from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that, in my opinion, it is what it's like when you try to ask volunteers to help you do anything. Check this out. Volunteers! Yeah. Oh, no, no way, not me, huh? Yeah, we don't volunteer for nothing. <laughs> He's not wrong. We need some help in the kids' room. We don't volunteer for nothing. We're packed, we need some more volunteers. Nope, what's in it for me? Anytime you try to motivate people and there's not carrots and sticks and there's not fear and manipulation, people are like, nah, I'm good. So what do people do in leadership positions? They're like, I got to motivate people, so let me throw out a carrot and stick. If you volunteer, we'll give you this. If you don't volunteer, then people are going to go to hell. We use fear manipulation and carrots and sticks. And I just refuse to use either. Because I don't think that that is the messaging of God. And if you're taking notes, which I highly encourage you to do, it is difficult to hear the voice of God when we are so accustomed to listening to the voice of fear. And it's one of the main goals of this entire series, and a big reason why we do a fear series almost every October, is because I'm convinced so many of us are so accustomed to listening to the voice of fear, that when the voice of God speaks, we just say, nope. And we literally wait until someone speaks in a language we understand. What language do we understand? Fear. So we're not going to volunteer, we're not going to do what we need to do until someone scares us. And then once someone scares us, we're like, I recognize that voice. And so I'll act if someone... Is fearful. I'll act if someone is scared. But I want to show you how the voice of God works. Look at our theme verse for today. 1 John 4, 18. It says, there is no fear in... There's an underlying word. Would you just humor me and say that out loud on the count of three? One, two, three. There's no fear in love. But perfect love does what? Drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. This verse specifically is talking about salvation, and that if you are, are a Christian, you don't have to fear the afterlife. You don't have to fear hell. You don't have to fear what's going to happen to you when you die. There is no fear in love. And so we've got to learn to discern what does the voice of God sound like. It's not going to come at us in a voice of fear. It's not going to come at us with carrots and sticks. The voice of God is going to come at us with love. But if we're not careful, we won't recognize that voice and we will say no. So when God speaks and says, hey, I need you to volunteer. When God speaks and says, I need you to give. If you're not careful, you will allow fear to lead you to make a decision because you're so used to listening to the voice of fear instead of the voice of God. And the truth is, is that some of us have so much fear in us, it is literally the only voice we recognize. So every year... Halloween comes around, and I see a bunch of Christians who speak out of a voice of fear. And so what I want to do in our remaining time is I want to hopefully teach you not how to think, but what to think. And I want to walk you through how should we respond to the message that's come from so many Christians that simply says you should never celebrate Halloween. 
that Halloween is the devil's holiday and you should have nothing to do with it. How should we respond to that? What is a Christian response? Now, there are three different groups of people in this room today. The first group is a group that you are all in for Halloween. You've never questioned it. You don't think nothing of it. You have drank the Kool-Aid, eaten the candy, you dressed up. You're like, Halloween's great. There's others of you, though, that either you're anti-Halloween or you're just conflicted about Halloween because you, or like me, grew up in church circles where they just taught. There's no other way to think about it. Halloween is the devil's holiday. And so like you, like some of you are even uncomfortable right now. They're dressed up on the devil's holiday. Like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. And then there's others of you who are just like, I don't give a rip. I don't care about Halloween. Like, I, I could care less about it. No matter what group you find yourself in, I want to teach us how to think biblically and how can we respond to the claims that Halloween is the devil's holiday. And I think you can apply this to any situation. When someone comes at you with fear and manipulation, you can apply what we're learning today to any of those situations. We're just going to use Halloween as our example today. So a few weeks ago, literally on the first week of October... I saw Christians sharing the following uh, statement, meme, all over Facebook. And it's by Ryan Lestrange. And I don't have a fat clue who Ryan Lestrange is. He sounds like a bad guy from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> I'm sure he's a great guy. But Ryan Lestrange says, I absolutely don't celebrate Halloween. No room for the devil here. I opt out of a day full of darkness, curses, and strongholds. Light doesn't mingle with darkness. Hashtag no Halloween. So that feels very cut and dry, right? It's like, well, how do you argue with that? Like light and darkness, they don't mix. I want to be a good Christian. Ryan must know what he's talking about. What Ryan is doing is Ryan is using in marketing what is known as a fear appeal. Fear appeals are persuasive messages that attempt to arouse fear by emphasizing, emphasizing the potential danger and harm that will befall individuals if they do not adopt the message's recommendations. And marketing uses it all the time. If you don't use our toothpaste, you'll get cavities. If you don't use this product, you're going to fall apart. If you don't have this in your marriage, you're destined for divorce. If you don't do this, it is, it is fear. And what did we learn in our scripture? The voice of love casts out the voice of fear. So if someone is using the voice of fear to motivate you, be careful. Because I don't think that's the voice of God. And he comes along the scene, and he gives us this really, really clear picture. But I want to teach you that fear-based language, it often sounds like one of the following. Fear-based language often sounds like if-then statements. If you celebrate Halloween, then you're giving a devil a foothold. That's a fear-based statement, because there's no way to argue with that. There's no other option. And so it's just very clear. If you do this, then this will happen to you. Another common fear-based language is black and white thinking. I absolutely don't celebrate Halloween. No room for the devil here. So it doesn't give you room to push back. And so what a statement like that does is you start to look at your life and you're like, wow, we did celebrate. Are we giving the devil a foothold? Oh my gosh, I have a headache right now. Is that because I celebrated Halloween? Is the devil attacking me right now? What happens is we allow fear to enter our life by fear-based marketing. And all of a sudden it just starts running rampant. In us, And once you understand what the voice of fear sounds like, you can start saying, okay, that's not the voice of God. I can listen to the voice of fear, but the voice of fear doesn't have a vote in my life. I can listen to it. It might be there. Maybe the voice of fear is protecting me, but maybe the voice of fear is lying to me. So I want to look at another post that deals with Halloween, and I want to walk us through how do we respond to it in a Christian way. And this post was sent to me by one of our owners, and um, she just was asking, what do we do with this? Like, how, how do we handle this? Because it seems so clear, but I'm kind of conflicted. I, I, I don't know how to respond to this. Here is uh, the initial image. This is by Kristen Alonzo. I'm sure she's a godly woman. I'm sure she loves Jesus. I don't know her from anyone. But she says, should Christians celebrate Halloween? Now, she is not going to let us debate it or figure it out for ourselves. She's going to give us the answer. And when you scroll to the next slide, this is what she says. Let's start with what is Halloween. The origins of Halloween go deep, and I encourage you to do your own research. But it is a pagan holiday that is also known as the Day of the Dead. There are many occult ties and witchcraft rooted in Halloween. You cannot Christianize Halloween. It is 100% rooted in paganism. 
Well, thanks, Kristen. End of the argument, right? We don't even need to read the rest of the post. What she says, it has to be true. But she says something at the very beginning that I would highly encourage you to do. She says, do your own research. And before you just adopt a meme that you see online, and before you adopt someone else's opinion, you should dig in and do a little bit of research yourself. And researching Halloween is really tricky because the same information is just shared over and over again. And you just see Christians literally for, for the last 40, 50 years have just been saying the same thing. That Halloween is pagan. Halloween's the devil holiday. But when you really get into the historical roots and understand, okay, where did Halloween first start? You find a very different message. There's a guy that I follow on TikTok. His name is uh, Inspiring Philosophy. And I really like him because, one, he's snarky. And so he just makes me laugh. But I also really like him because he doesn't just share his opinion. He constantly is going back to historical documents and saying, hey, this is what everyone's saying, but this is the oldest document on this subject, and this says something very different. And I want to show you his clip because he gives us, based off real history, where Halloween actually comes from. Check this out. Don't worry, I'll tell them. Neither Christmas or Halloween is pagan. Come at me, bro. I've already dealt with Christmas extensively in this video. There is no evidence any major tradition associated with Christmas comes from paganism. But Halloween is right around the corner, which means everyone who gets their history from memes is about to tell us that Halloween comes from the ancient pagan Celtic festival of Samhain. The problem is we have no early sources which indicate the date of Samhain. It was probably celebrated sometime in the fall, but we're not sure on the exact date. As historian Ronald Hutton says, it must be concluded, therefore, that the medieval records furnish no evidence that 1st November was a major pan-Celtic festival. According to St. Bede, September was called Holy Month, which may be indicative of certain pagan festivals that were celebrated during that time. He also says November was called Blood Month because of an annual sacrifice to the gods but we're not given any dates on which Celtic fall festivals were observed. In all likelihood, the day on which Celtic festivals were observed probably varied from year to year, because Bede also says they calculated their seasons according to the cycles of the moon. Halloween did not come from Samhain, it just means All Hallows Eve, which is the eve of All Saints Day on November 1st. In the earliest centuries of Christianity, Christians in different regions had a day on which they would honor all saints or martyrs. In Celtic regions, that day was actually April 20th, not November 1st. Bede's Martyrology from the 8th century does not mention that All Saints Day was on November 1st. But by the 9th century, Christians in Germanic regions were celebrating All Saints Day on November 1st, and then it spread to the rest of Christendom from there. As the historian Ronald Hutton tells us, it had not however started in Ireland, where the flare of Angus and the Martyrology of Tallow proved that the early medieval churches celebrated the Feast of All Saints upon 20 April. This makes nonsense of the notion that the November date was chosen because of Celtic influence. Rather, both Celtic Europe and Rome followed a Germanic idea. Over time, All Hallows' Eve became associated with the dead, and it wasn't until European traditions were blended in America that we got the modern holiday of Halloween. As for Samhain, we have no evidence it was a celebration of the dead, and we're not sure on which day it occurred, although it probably occurred annually sometime in November. So Halloween is actually an entirely Christian holiday in origin, although it has been modified over the centuries to become something entirely other at this point. Tell that to your pastor growing up. <laughs> I didn't learn that in Sunday school. Well, you're telling me that history actually says that Halloween, the original origins of it, started from a Christian holiday. And it started in Germany. And this is incredibly important because Germans, uh, in, the, in the, the primary church at the time, was the Catholic Church. And um, All Saints Day, or Hallows Day, was a big tradition in, uh, in the Catholic Church. And that people would come from all around to celebrate the saints who have passed away, who have already gone on to heaven. And so church would be packed. And in the 1500s, a priest by the name of Martin Luther started researching the Bible himself. And what he started to learn is that some of the things that the Catholic Church was teaching people was not true. It wasn't based off what Scripture actually teaches. 
And one of the main things that he taught and that he was against is that the Catholic Church constantly taught that if you want to get to heaven, you've got to earn your way there. You've got to give money. Give money to the church, and then you get to heaven. And, and Luther comes out and is like, no, that's not what Paul says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that salvation is a free gift based off grace and faith in God. And you can't earn your way to heaven. And so Luther gets riled up, and he writes a 95 thesis, 95 points that are going against the common teachings of the Catholic Church. And he posts it on the church door, and he posts it on All Hallows' Eve. Why does he do that? Because the next day, on All Hallows' Day, All Saints' Day, is going to be packed at church. It was bigger attended than Christmas and Easter. And so he knows all these people are going to come in, and they're going to see his 95 theses. And so from there, Christians in the church really celebrated. They had two things to celebrate, All Saints' Day, and then they had Reformation Day, the day that Martin Luther came out with his 95 theses. Now, <clears throat> since then, it's been taken over by Hallmark and American, and it's been uh, influenced by a bunch of things. But here's something that's absolutely fascinating. Did you know that there is no historical evidence and no one had anything to do with Halloween and no one even included the occult or Satan with Halloween until the 1960s? All of history does not say that Halloween was a pagan holiday. In the 1960s, a guy that was the, the, the founder of the Satanic Church, he used a lot of fear to try to motivate people. And he comes out with a message that says, if you're a Christian, thanks for celebrating the devil's holiday. And Christians heard that and were like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to celebrate that holiday anymore. And it rose from the 1960s until the 1980s. And in the 1980s, it peaked with Christians saying, Halloween is definitively a satanic holiday, and we want nothing to do with it. But that's not what history teaches. History actually teaches it comes from a very different place. It actually has its roots in Christian history. So let's see what Kristen says next. Kristen says, it's extremely clear. Is it? <laughs> there is nothing about Halloween that is holy. It's hard, I know. We've been raised thinking it's okay to somehow make Halloween innocent, for us as Christians, but light and darkness cannot mix, no matter how you try to justify it. Okay, did you catch the fear-based black and white thinking? You can't mix light and darkness. There's only one answer to this. It's my answer, and if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. But here's the thing. She's trying to use fear to motivate us, and what I would push back on is even if Halloween started with pagan roots, and in case you haven't been paying attention, it did not. But even if Halloween started with pagan roots, I would say as Christians, let's steal it. Let's take it back. The devil's been stealing stuff from God since the beginning of time. Music, God's idea. What does Satan do? He comes around and perverts it. So rock and roll music comes on, and in the 60s, you know what the church says? The church says all rock and roll music is evil. All rock and roll music is of the devil. And so these hippies created what's called the Jesus Movement, and it created what now we call CCM, Christian Contemporary Music. And they started playing rock music with Jesus lyrics. And you know what the church said? The church said, that's evil. You should have nothing to do with rock and roll music. So this hippie by the name of Larry Norman, he comes out with a song, and he says, why should the devil have all the good music? And I love that. Why are we just going to bend over and let the devil take it? Why, why, do we, why do we have to just like give him everything? If he's taking something, let's take it back. Music, God's idea. Holidays, God's idea. All throughout the Bible, there are holidays. If there is anyone who should know how to throw a party, it's Christians. We literally have the joy of the Lord. We are the ones that celebrate the fact that God came and died and then rose again. We should know how to have fun even without alcohol. We should know how to celebrate. Literally, Christians should throw the best parties and the best celebrations around because we have more to celebrate than anyone else. So if the devil, which he did not, but if the devil created Halloween, I say we take it back. Why should the devil have all the good candy? That's what I say. It's not a satanic holiday, but hey, listen, if he, if he stole it, let's take it back. I love the, the quote by one pastor, Mike Iaconelli. He says, Christians don't condone unbiblical living. We redeem it. Christians don't condone. What does that mean? Well, we don't go along with unbiblical living. We don't say, oh, the Bible says that's sin, but I'm just going to participate anyway. That's not what Christians do. 
What do Christians do? We redeem unbiblical living. What does it mean to redeem? Redeem means to take back something that was stolen, lost, sold, or given away. So Satan didn't invent Halloween, but even if he did, let's take it back. Anything in this world where someone's like, ooh, that's evil, we shouldn't have anything to do with it, let's redeem it. Let's show the world how to celebrate in a godly way. You want to redeem Halloween, there's some easy ways to do that. Number one, you don't have to dress up like a devil or Satan on Halloween. Dress up in, a, in an appropriate costume. Even if you're like, okay, I'm not even about all that occult scary stuff, can I just give you a very practical way that we can redeem Halloween? Especially if you were a female. I went through the costume store a couple weeks ago, and every aisle had sexy versions of every costume. Sexy priest, sexy nun. I'm like, who's dressing up like a sexy nun? <laughs> every costume, literally. You want to redeem Halloween? You want to stand out? Just don't buy the sexy costume. Just wear a little bit extra clothing. People will be like, whoa, that's different. You can have fun on Halloween and not show your whole body? That's different. We can redeem holidays. We can redeem things in a way that honors God. And we don't have to be so afraid. I am so tired of Christians acting like Satan is on par with, with, with God. Satan and God are not equals. God is all-powerful. Satan's not. So when fear speaks, you need to know greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Stop letting the devil win. Let's see what Christian has to say next. Only the Holy Spirit can convict you, but once you have seen and heard the truth, you are held responsible to respond. Sin is sin, evil is evil, and truth is truth, regardless of our intentions. Now that last sentence, I agree with most of it. The first half, I think, is true. Sin is sin, evil is evil, truth is truth. But the last part, regardless of your intentions, I'm going to need you to give me a Bible verse to back that up, Kristen. Because I think our intentions matter a lot. In fact, there's no Bible verses that tell us whether we should celebrate Halloween or not, but there's a very similar circumstance. In the early church, the common custom of the general population was to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. And so they would sacrifice this meat to fake, just horrible gods that are very pagan, and then they would sell it in the marketplace and they would eat the meat. And there was a group of Christians who were like, oh, we can't eat that meat because we know the origin of it. And there's another group of Christians who was like, eh, like it doesn't matter. Like, I'm going to say a blessing and give it to God. Like, who cares where it comes from? And this was such a big uh, divisive issue in the church that Paul addresses it. And I want to show you what Paul says, because I think we can apply this to Halloween. 1 Corinthians 1, 8 through 3. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So before Paul addresses this subject, he gives a warning, and the warning is knowledge puffs up. And I want to make sure that you hear this. As you gain knowledge and as you learn about God, you need to understand that often that will come with pride, and pride is not from God. And so whether you land on this, whether you think, hey, Halloween is great, or you're like, oh, Halloween's of the devil, no matter where you land with this, please understand that your response should come with a lot of humility. Because when it comes with pride, it's not of God. And Paul says, be careful. Because knowledge puffs up. Let's keep going. Let's see what he says next. 1 Corinthians 8, 7 through 8. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it's defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. So Paul says, listen, we know the truth. We know the truth of the matter. Now that you've been in church on this Sunday at Next Level, you know the truth about Halloween. You know it. But there are a lot of people who don't know the truth. And all they've seen is the memes. And they're going to go and they're going to lead and they're going to say, Halloween is evil, it's of the devil. And our response is like, okay, even if it's of the devil, I'm not going to give in to that. And Paul's telling these people with the food sacrificed to idols, he's like, listen, the, the idols, they're fake. We know those gods don't even exist. So even if someone sacrificed food to that idol, redeem it. Still eat it and give credit to God. But look at what he says next. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister from whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. 
When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Paul gives us a Christian response. And the Christian response is don't live in fear. Eat the meat. We know those are fake gods. Eat it. Redeem it. But there are some Christians, Paul calls the weaker brother and sister. And they don't know this knowledge yet. And they're going to hold on to their fear. And they're going to come at you and they're going to say, it's of the devil. You shouldn't have anything to do with that. And Paul says, listen, if that's where they feel, I'm going to give them grace. I'm not going to fight them. In fact, for unity's sake, I would rather give up eating this meat than to cause a division in the church. So as a Christian, if you go to a family member's house and they start telling you how evil Halloween is, the Christian response is not to debate them. You can ask them, hey, do you want to know the history of it? I learned it from my pastor. And if they're like, no, you say, okay, that's cool. You don't force Halloween on them. You're like, okay, cool, that's their conviction. They're doing their best. Every meme that I showed you today, it's coming from Christians who are doing their best to honor God. And so we say, okay, you're the weaker brother. You're convicted by it. I'll let you go. But I'm not going to allow your fear to dictate what I do. I'm going to stand on the truth. And I'm going to redeem culture and not let fear win. And that's my prayer for you as we conclude this series. I pray that when fear comes, and when fear speaks to you, you'll be able to quickly tell, okay, that's not the voice of God. And you'll be able to make decisions based on what is truth, what is the voice of God, and what is the voice of fear. And there are going to be times when the voice of fear speaks to you, and you're going to need to come at it strong and say, no, 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 no. You need to be quiet, because that's not coming from my God. And there are going to be times when well-meaning, good Christians come at you and they try to motivate you with fear and manipulation and you don't have to fight them, you don't have to block them, you don't have to like yell at them you can just bless and release and say oh, you're the weaker brother, that's what Paul does but I'm not going to allow their fear to dictate how I make decisions why? because my God is a God of love and perfect love casts out fear today if you're here and you have never asked Jesus to become a part of your life, I want to give you that opportunity. But I want you to know that there's no fear involved with this. I'm not going to try to twist your arm or make you feel scared. I'm not going to try to scare the hell out of you. I just want you to know that God loves you so much. And He wants a relationship with you. And He wants to save you, not just for eternity. He wants to save you right now. And you can know the God of the universe. And He will radically change your life. And if you've never met Jesus, but you'd like to, I want to give you a chance to do that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'd like to become a Christian today, I just want to invite you to repeat this prayer quietly after me. Just repeat it in your heart. God, we come before you, and I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've fallen short of your standards. I thank you that you sent your son to die for my sins. I thank you that I'm forgiven. I thank you that I'm redeemed. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would enter my heart and that you would save me. And I ask you to give me the courage to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.